Welcome back to The Mining Pod. On today's show, we're joined by Andy White, CEO of White Rock Management, an OG in the space. Andy walks us through the current mining landscape, also gives us his long-term Bitcoin mining thesis and a primer on European Bitcoin mining. Andy, welcome to the Mining Pod. Thank you so much for your time today. I know it's late over in Europe, but uh, we're really keen to hear what you have to say on the mining market and uh, what you have to say about White Rock Management. So again, thank you for joining today. Happy, happy to be here. Well, you know, it's uh, it's been a, a fun, fun few uh, months at the start of 2023, and uh, really looking forward to uh, talking to you about our business and also, you know, the mining ecosystem generally. Yeah, to, to go back to your earlier point, it has been a fun few months, right? Bitcoin's been up about 50% since the beginning of the year. That's giving a lot of hope to people, a little wind to everyone's sales. Uh, I think a lot of miners in October, especially November, December, were looking at this and being like, wow, I just bought a really expensive ASIC and I'm not really going to make a good return on investment uh, based on the numbers right now. Of course, that was the bottom of the bear market. We saw a lot of capitulation. A lot of firms blew up. We seem to be on the other side of that. Uh, maybe not, maybe more is to come. But right now, based on the miners that are still around, based on the public companies or other companies that have exploded in this space, like FTX or Genesis, seems like we're past that. Uh, and I think it's a good place for us to jump in the conversation to sort of talk about the mining market, how you view it, your hypothesis going into this year. Uh, but to begin, we got to get a little bio from you just so our audience is more familiar with you. So I'll hand it back to you. Uh, your involvement in the space as an OG and then what you're currently doing. Sure, no problem. So I've, I've been mining since um, 2013, really first days of ASICs. I remember waiting for months and months and months for Butterfly Labs little cube to arrive. I think it was like five gigahash or something. Um, and um, built one of the first data centers that was constructed with mining in mind up in Sweden in 2014. That was my old company, Hivo 66, uh, which was acquired by Northern Data a few years ago. So it's really been interesting watching the, for me, watching the, you know, the change in the market and the evolution of the hardware. So mining all the way through, through that period. And then I joined YROC in November, 2021. Before Bitcoin, um, I have a background, a bit of a, bit of a closet techie. You know, I did a computer science degree at the end of the eighties, uh, in Scotland. Um, and, uh, you know, spend a bunch of time in telecoms and the internet business, little side, uh, side time in, in, in finance and, uh, and asset management, but really my, my kind of core love has always been, you know, technology and innovation. And so as I, when I found out about Bitcoin the second time around, actually, I remember talking about it with somebody when it was 50 bucks. And it being 25, it was 50, and I was like, is it going to go back to 25? You know, these are the conversations and the memories that you have that, that you, you can regret over time. But the second time I looked at it in detail, I thought, yeah, this is something that's really interesting. And especially when we went from you know, FPGA and GPU mining to the first ASICs, that kind of increase in performance, um, you know, was really exciting. Of course, there's always difficulty. Uh, pulling you back and everybody who's ever done a spreadsheet. And I think most people watching the podcast have made a spreadsheet of like out of this themselves at some point where you, you, you forecast your future returns. People always get a difficulty wrong. And, uh, you know, the number of decks that I've seen over the years of people who have got a business model, how they're going to make like two, mil two billion bucks. Um, you know, back in the days of the kind of the ETH pitches as well in 2017 and 18, um, the network is pretty good at self-correcting, but it's been a, it's been a fun ride and, uh, really, really enjoying the, um, the, the business I'm in now and, uh, mining in Europe and in the U S. Yeah. We'll definitely have to talk about mining in Europe, which has sort of taken a backseat to Texas and the U S for the moment, but definitely some conversation lines there. I want to go back to the difficulty part because I think that's a, a really key consideration for people who are looking at mining right now. I doubled basically uh, last year or what, 50%. And that was a big problem for a lot of people who, like you said, were sort of mapping out projections for their mining income and mining rewards. And of course, that's what happened. The, the funny thing about difficulty is it's a, a true picture of competition for mining Bitcoin, right? And so you sort of always underestimate what your competition is like. 
curious from your perspective, how did you guys at White Rock Management or maybe in the past when you've been building uh, your your prior mining firms, how did you guys think about difficulty and how did you guys correct when you were inevitably wrong? I'm assuming you're wrong at some point on difficulty because it's just, it's really hard to guess. Yeah, I was expecting it to be a bit higher at the end of um, 2022, to be honest. You know, I've, I've, I'm usually pretty bearish when it comes to difficulty. Um, people don't like to hear it because I'm telling them that the returns aren't going to be what they think they're going to be. Um, but I think the two things that held difficulty back last year, one was the bear market, obviously. And the second was the failure of a number of infrastructure providers. So there was a lot of public miners who were speaking about the amount of hardware that they had, uh, commissioned or installed brackets, small type, non energize. So, you know, great news that you've got them plugged into the containers and, and you've done the wiring, but if you don't actually have any power going to the container, it doesn't really help. And so the large miners that didn't get all of their hardware plugged in combined with the, um, the disincentive to mine, if you have high power costs and you're at 16 K Bitcoin or 18 K Bitcoin is what slowed us down. Um, but what we see now, you know, um, we're looking at one of the biggest adjustments ever, um. Uh, you know, we're speaking uh, towards the end of February here, and it's looking like we're going to get a 12 or 12 percent increase uh, at the end of this week. Um, you know, th this just speaks to lots of new hardware coming online, lots of XPs probably coming online, uh, and it's not going to go away. So, difficulty is a good thing. It means that the network is secure. It means that uh, Sailor's encrypted wall of energy is is doing its job, but it, it's an arms race. Um, what is good though, compared to the old days is that the hardware that we get today lasts longer. So when we were going from, you know, 110 to 55 to 28 nanometer type ASICs, um, every year your entire fleet would be scrap, right? You know, the average life of an, of an ASIC was 12 months. And so you really had to worry about my God, if I don't get my payback, um, by the end of this year of 12 months from the installation and quite often they would arrive late, um, I'm never going to make made my money back unless I just keep the Bitcoin in the hodl and I don't sell them. So now we see hardware lasting a longer, um, but as long as we're in this, we're in this bull, um, I think we'll see difficulty start, you know, keep on running for, for, for 2023. Um, how did we cope with it? Um, we, we try and put our hardware in as friendly jurisdictions as possible with, with low power costs, obviously. And then we've made a point of not leveraging up, of not borrowing to buy hardware. And this is the thing that really shook the more um, uh, fragile companies out of the tree uh, at the end of 2022. If your um, income from mining is substantially less than your uh, debt payments, then you can only survive for so long. Uh, so you really have to, and I think, you know, the, the bears that I saw, uh, the two big ones between 2014 and, and now before, before the one that we were just in, were both 80, 85% drawdowns. And, you know, you learn in those markets to try and build your, build your business to be resilient in the bad times as well as the good, because they're going to come. Yeah. I love that point about, uh, how you be more bearish or how you were more bearish. Cause I think that definitely prepares you for, uh, for the bad times, which we certainly have been going through the last few months. I want to go back to what you're saying about the public liners with all these giant projections, right? That was a huge thing in 2021 where we had these large orders from Bitmain being announced stock would just pump on the news and then of course these asics have been sitting in boxes haven't been plugged in it does look like a lot of those asics are now being plugged in which has been sort of leading to the, the sudden rise in hash rate uh foundry pool i think is like sort of a good proxy for this ride because there's so many institutions who use foundry uh who who like plug it directly to that pool and that pool has been growing tremendously i think this month it's on pace to uh get probably around 2000 blocks, uh, which is a lot. And it's been growing versus last year, about like a two point, uh, by like a factor of two or so. That's a, that's a lot of hash rate coming online in North America. Curious your thoughts about like where that is all going. Like, do you think we still have a lot more ASICs to plug in for these public miners or are they getting close to kind of plugging in their last boxes from orders back in 21? I think, yeah, the stuff that was ordered end of 21, start of 2022, 20, which was all you know, eighty, ninety dollars a terra hash, even if they had some price adjustments, probably when they were when they were finally shipped. 
Um, most of that will be will be coming live now. Uh, I think you know we, we've we've got past that, and anything that was being held back um, will be deployed in this quarter. Um, the the delays in some of the big infrastructure companies have probably shaken themselves out, and the Chapter Eleven resolutions means that people then say, okay, well, now I own all these containers. I'll go and do the power deal, and I'll and I'll I'll, I'll make it happen. But there's you know the foundries are still making chips. And so, um, you know, our, our friends at the, at the ASIC manufacturers and, you know, you have to really salute the innovation in, you know, what modern ASICs are actually capable of. Um, they're going to keep, if, if you've got a machine that prints money, you know, you're going to keep running the machine and, uh, they, they, they're very good at setting the price to, to maximize their, their return in over the, I mean, the ASIC market is, I guess, 10 years old now. And, um, you know, it's consolidated around really only a handful of, of key players. There used to be a lot more of a wild west. Um, you know, back in the day, um, you would go to a, a, a Bitcoin show, a trade show, 2014, 15, and there'd be like 20 different basic manufacturers, you know, just, just give us $20 million so we can do our tape out. And I, you know, I could, if we had a couple of hours, I could tell you stories about some of the manufacturers that did one run and then. All they got was a shoebox full of chips that they couldn't use. Or um, there's a whole story about fried cat in China as well. If anybody knows who fried cat is, then they're a proper OG. I'm definitely gonna get you on to do like a book recording or something like that because there's uh, there's some stories we can't lose. We need to keep them for yeah. the mining history. Yeah. Well, let's go back to White Rock Management and talk a little bit about that because I think just from a strategy perspective, it's nice to have someone who's like actively building a firm. You've built multiple firms now. Uh, looking at the current picture, we're about $24,000 Bitcoin. Uh, difficulty, I think, is around $39 trillion right now. Hash price is hovering around $0.08. Cents. Like, the market's pretty good. Like, if you have a next-generation machine, like, you're you're in the green right now. But what does it look like going to next year? And how are you thinking about, like, all the variables here, whether that be deployments, finding new energy, buying new machines, working with strategic partners, wherever you want to take it. I'm just curious on your, uh, your yeah. thoughts since, you know, as an OG in the space, you got, have, you have a little wisdom to shed to our audience. Well, I mean, the, the classic problem here is that there's too many variables. And so, you know, you can make your forecast look good or bad by changing your price forecast or by changing your, your diff forecast or by changing your power price or, or whatever. And we know that these all play into each other. It's like the old foxes and rabbits, you know, they, they're one affects the other. <clears throat> and there's, there's too many variables and not enough equations. You can't solve it. So my kind of default setting is to be bullish on price. And the reason it makes sense to be bullish on price, if you're not bullish on price for the, for the medium to long term, then you shouldn't be mining anyway. You know, if you, if, you, if, you, if you assume that we stay where we are, we stay flat for the next kind of 24 months and difficulty keeps ramping, then only people who are stealing power or have two cents will, make, will be making money anyway. You know, especially when we get to the halving in 2024. So, um, well, you don't have to kind of plug in stock to flow or the rainbow chart or anything, but I'd be incredibly surprised if we're not like well into six figure Bitcoin at the end of 2024. Um, usually it's six months after the halving that you see this kind of big uptick. And, um, I don't see anything to suggest that that won't happen again. Um, the other thing that I think is bullish is that, you know, some of the businesses that have disappeared, uh, at the end of last year. Um, that perhaps we're selling Bitcoin that didn't really exist, you know, that, that disrupts the supply and demand. You know, if you, if you rely on there being more demand than supply to be bullish about the future price, um, then you can't have people selling imaginary Bitcoin. So I think, you know, I think one of the SEC guys was on, was on one of the morning shows a couple of days ago saying, Hey, not your keys, not your coins. When, when the SEC is saying that. You know, then that that speaks to um, twenty one million and people not relying on synthetic exposure. Or um, my exchange tells me that I've got these coins. They're you know we're really going to be limited by by the by the supply um, that's built into the system, and it doesn't take a lot of institutional demand, right? It, you know, a fraction of half a percent, a few basis points of allocation to Bitcoin, you know, either through national governments or through you know pension funds or passive investment funds, whatever, there's not a lot to go around. So 
you start with that bullish price case and then you really just model the kind of the good times and the bad times and, and make sure that you can live through the short term volatility. I'm curious about the, the halving question, which I'm sure is going to be a topic ad nauseum on all Bitcoin podcasts going over to yeah. the next 18 to 12 months, right? Uh, but I do want to like single out that one phrase you said, which is there's no reason for this time to be different in terms of like at six months after it happening, we'll probably see our price action. The last pump was so devastating though on the back end, right? FTX, Genesis, Drios Capital, like we go on, right? A lot of people think that that's a reason why we might see a different cycle bear out. You've been in the space though for quite a while and there's been a lot of bad names out there uh, that were just as devastating in terms of percentage, right, to the space. So I wonder if you have any pushback on uh, people who are kind of pointing that out, saying we might have a different cycle this time. Well, it's, I mean, it's like uh, the three most dangerous words investing, right? This time's different. So if you go back and you think about how you felt in 2014, 2015, when we went from uh, 1200 down to, you know, below 300 or 2017, 18, we went from 20 K down to a low of like three. And I mean, I remember that I remember sitting on a harbor on an island in Sweden. Um, in I'm looking back at the chart here, it would have been around about August, 2018. And I think it went from like 6K to 3.5, more or less the same day. I mean, it was, it was like over the weekend or something, or it was maybe five or six days. And we'd been having this big conversation about, hey, maybe we should sell, we should sell some of our, some of our stack, right? Because we've got some CapEx coming up and it dropped by 50% in, you know, practically overnight. You know, these are, these are kind of, kind of character forming experiences, but I just come back to the, the economics of the, of, of the system. You know, if we've, we've got 400 exahash running in 2024 and maybe 500 by the end of 2024 and the block reward goes from 6.25 to 3.125. Um, you know, these production numbers that, that Ryan and Marath and everybody talking about today, you know, if they stay static, they, they drop in half and, you know, suddenly you, you just have to fight so hard for every, for every coin. And we, I think the market is kind of short sighted. We, we, we look at what's happening next week or next month and nobody really likes to talk about what Bitcoin will be doing in, in 2027 or in 2030, once we've had another two halvings, because you just sound crazy, right? You know, I mean, some people are, are fine, you know, like, I mean, I had the back who's, who's like, we're talking about Jay's is like, he's in the white paper for God's sake. You know, he, he's, uh, I, I admired him greatly. Um, and he talks quite happily about, you know, what that means for the end of the decade and, you know, seven digit Bitcoin and, and beyond. And when we're there, everybody will be saying, well, you know, I knew it was going to happen. But, you know, unless he, <laughs> it, it still feels a bit weird to be talking about it. But I, I remember, you know, mining were like, it's like $300 Bitcoin and the block reward is 25 Bitcoin every 10 minutes. And it's so much harder now. I went back and looked at the <clears throat> the first mine that we we built um, um, with uh, my, my friends in the, in the old business and and uh, uh, and we had a, a two megawatt um, mine uh, with KNC hardware. KNC was a Swiss, sorry, Swedish ASIC manufacturer, and this thing was huge. You know, it's like it took a long time to build, um, lots of effort. Um, there wasn't that kind of supply chain ready to kind of ship thousands of PDUs over from China that you had to kind of build it in quite an expensive way. And I looked back at what the hash rate was of this kind of two megawatt mine. And it was, it was a hundred terahash, which is one S19. And then we cool. had, we've got this like team photo of like, you know, one of the guys is holding up, holding up a piece of paper with like, you know, the stat from the, the management platform, hundred terahash two megawatts but so mm. um we have short memories and i think you know when the halving hits it, you don't see some kind of massive impact on the day apart from usually kind of different fall a little bit you know in the following two weeks because people will turn some hardware off um probably depending on the price but as as you kind of get through that to be the six month period afterwards the scarcity sinks in and you know, if you if you look at a um, a log scale chart going back to 2013-14, you can you can see this pattern, and it, it's just 
it doesn't guarantee that it's going to happen again, but it's very hard to see um, as long as people stay interested in Bitcoin. And um, I don't see that. I only see adoption and interest going in one direction. Um, suddenly it gets twice as hard to make the thing and there's half as much, half as many new coins being created. I just think it's incredibly good. Yeah, I love the fact that you're thinking about the future here. I and mean, so oftentimes it's it's really easy to just focus or fixate on the, the near term. And that's why we're out for price action right now. Because at the beginning of the year, it's been up 50%, right? That's put a lot of uh put a lot of gusto in people's spirits. I want to turn towards like what you think about the mining market going into the next two years, though, and specifically the happening. Again, this is a conversation people are going to trot out quite a lot, but we haven't had it so much so in this podcast so far. Um, and one angle that might be interesting here for listeners is the fact that a lot of the mining operations you run are currently in Europe, which is known for having higher energy prices, uh, specifically over the last year. So going into 2022 or 2023, 2024, how are you thinking about energy prices with the halving coming up? What are you guys doing in order to secure cheaper rates? And what, from a strategy standpoint, what do you uh, push people to be able to find? Yeah, so we're always on the lookout for for new sites and anywhere that you can get long term, low rate renewable power is great. Uh, and you know, I definitely buy into the um, the position that you know Bitcoin is creating an incentive for for energy companies for utilities to invest in new generation. So if you can be somewhere that has three or four cent power um, and that you've got and, it, and it's renewable, it means that you're more you're much more isolated from uh, energy market shocks. So in 2022, the, in the second half of the year, we saw a bit of a perfect storm with the war in Ukraine, with the gas, the gas situation, with uh, nuclear power stations getting turned off in France and in and in Finland. We saw an unusually um, kind of dry winter. We saw uh, like cold temperatures with wind turbines icing up. All these factors came together, and we saw prices, for example, in Sweden, that were more than five times what you would normally expect it to be. But it's, this is a blip. Um, you know, these, these markets stay pretty stable. And I think there is, there's plenty of renewable power out there. You just have to be willing to kind of go and look for it and to make the investment because quite often there's power, but there isn't, um, substation, mm -hmm. no transformers. Then you've got to take the six month or the 12 month view. Um, High Bitcoin price solves all evils, right? You know, so if it doesn't, here's the thing. Everyone is like super excited about, oh, how many XPs they've got versus how many S19 pros. And I've got 21 joule per terahash fleet instead of a 30 tera, joule per terahash fleet. But there's a real gap in the, the price of that hash rate. So what you would want to own in 2023 and 2024 is very different depending on what the Bitcoin price is. Because if, if we're in this, if we're in a prolonged bear market and you really scraping around like we were in 2022 at the end of the year, just to keep your head above water because $60,000 Bitcoin and high difficulty, then, you know, the high, the, the latest generation hardware really shines because your power cost is, is that much lower, third lower. But if you've got a hundred million dollars to spend, or even $10 million, and you're given a choice, you know, do you want uh, two or three times the hash rate for that amount of cash, but it's going to use 30, 40% more power. And it's 2024 and Bitcoin's $200,000. Well, you probably prefer to have the hash than to have a slightly lower power bill. And so it, but I don't know which one it's going to be, right? So if you're in this kind of low market, then, okay, I'm happy to have more efficient miners, but it depends how much you're willing to pay for that premium. So sometimes it's, it's a narrow difference and sometimes it's a big difference. But the power, uh, the, the, the amount of hash rate you got from an S9 versus uh, an S19, it's a huge difference. But mm -hmm. we're getting more and more marginal gains now as we get the next generations of hardware. So instead of an order of magnitude, it's that 30% more efficient, 40% more efficient. So these are the, these are the things that keep us up at night, kind of working out, you know, the compromises that you have to make, but, um, being open to going to new territories and looking at new power sources and being a bit innovative, uh, is at the heart and staying away from markets where you can be, 
uh, you know, it really influenced by like super high gas prices or by something else. The other thing that you can do is to diversify, right? So we, we're in Europe, we're in the US, we were in Asia, we moved out of Asia because we didn't like the way the political situation was going. So if you're diversified, then you can keep running, even if you have an issue on one site, whether it is local power issues or, I mean, Marathon had a big issue in Harden, right? Where they had, first of all, the power station needed its sulfur dioxide pipes cleaned out or something. And then just as they got all that done, uh, this massive storm came through and, you know, I feel sorry for Fred, but you know, that's, that's life. So that's why you diversified, you know, you have one site that gets affected by yeah. prices or by, or by some natural problem or by an underlying supplier giving you issues. So you, you want to be in more than one place. Yeah. I love a few points you brought up there in terms of Europe right now, what are you seeing as, as big plays? Uh, I read, read a few analysts out there talk about European mining and the things I've seen is Scandinavia is really tough right now. Like energy prices are so high, even the stranded stuff that you mentioned can be tough to go into. Is there a great place to be mining in Europe at the moment, or is it really you have to be looking elsewhere or have an established foothold there already? I mean, really, really in Europe, um, I think you know, it's in, it's Nordics, it's Sweden, it's Norway, and then Iceland are the traditional homes of mining. Um, yeah. Everywhere else in Europe, more or less, is just way too expensive. Like, yeah. you know, 10 times too expensive. You have like 40 cent power in the UK. Like you can't mine with 40 cent power. Yeah. Unless it's somebody else and certainly don't know that you're using it, right? <laughs> so there's, a, there's an ongoing kind of political di dialogue in, in Europe as well about regulation and Somebody from the EU will say, oh, you know, you should, do, they, they read the change the code thing that the, was it, who was it funded it? I can't remember. Was that, uh, uh, Ripple people, yeah. Ripple guy. Uh, yeah. Right. Do you think of stake and Bitcoin in the same sentence as to not understand what Bitcoin is? Yeah. And they also don't think about the, the knock on effect, right? So there's a ton of mining in Sweden and it's more or less all on wind and uh, hydro. You know, the river that, that we're on and that my old uh, business that I, that I was the startup CEO of is on in, in the north of Sweden, which is a beautiful place, by the way. We we'll recommend anyone to visit it. But that one river has 4,000 megawatts of power on it. And they can't use it all. So there's heavy industry up there and they still can't use it all. Uh, and there's not enough transmission lines to send it to send it down south. But if you were to say, oh, hey, let's buy an, let's buy an proof of work. It's not like Hive and us and everybody else are going to say, oh, well, um, oh, we better just recycle these miners that we bought then. Let's uh, call up, the, call up the, the local scrap guy and have them take them away. No, you put them in a truck and you put them in a plane and you take them somewhere else. And if your policy initiative means that those miners are taken from 100% hydroelectric power that would otherwise not be generated and not used, the water would just run down the river. And they get taken somewhere where it's like grid gas or, you know, some other, or coal. Yeah. Well, what's been the net effect of your in, in amazing policy initiative? It's been to increase addition. So I think, I think they'll back away from that. I don't think that's going to happen. And these short term bumps that we get in, in the price. Yeah. I've been watching, I've been watching the SE1 power price since 2013. And it is, you know, it, it comes back, it, it comes back. So you just have to be ready to. Uh, back off or curtail in, you know, if, if the power spikes up for a few hours, one, one day in winter and spikes, don't bite. Two more questions for you as we uh, wrap up the show here. First one, curious for your thoughts about the U.S. mining right now, or, or maybe North American mining in general, since you guys do have a U.S. footprint, what's your thought on work in the U.S.? Uh, assuming you've been working in the U.S. for a while, how have you seen it change? Do you think it's getting like a little too big, uh, mainly kind of winking and nodding at like all the deployments in the U.S. really inching towards like 30%, 40% hash rate dominance in one jurisdiction, which a lot of people don't want to see that happen again, right? Yeah. And I think it is probably there's, there's a natural, you know, as conditions change, we saw what happened with the China ban, right? You know, it, we got that drop in hash rate and then it all moved kind of two, three months later. So I, I think the U.S. is a great environment for miners. Um, there are good states and there are bad states and there, uh, there are states that have advantages and disadvantages. So, um, I think there's a trend towards more and more owned infrastructure 
for the larger players. Um, the the guys who set themselves up to be the you know infrastructure providers at large scale to the to the listed miners bit off more than they could chew and couldn't survive uh, the bear market. I think there's an interesting question around um, the money that some companies are spending on immersion. You know, it mm. it's technically it's, it's wonderful, but I would say it's a solution looking for a problem with an intended bug because the amount of money that you have to spend and to build these facilities and then the delay that you have in getting your miners you know, dropped in the tank. Um, I, I find it hard to see how that how that plays out in terms of the extra profitability, unless we get to this insane bull case, and then you just want every every ha- every terra hash that you can, or every pet of hash that you can uh, you can muster. Um, so I'm 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 bullish on the US. I think it's a it's a great market. We've seen some initiatives in some states where people oh they're they're going to ban mining or they're going to restrict it, and then there's other states who are passing laws and say you know it's your it's your Absolute constitution, not constitutional, but it's your legal right to mine. Um, yeah, was it Missouri or something that like recently said that? I can't remember. So yeah, I think Mississippi is working on it, it's some sort of form of that. Yeah, so you've got the, the, This is a nice thing about the states is you have this competition between each state, and if one state makes is hostile to mine, fine. You know, there's plenty of others to go to. So yeah. you know, I think you know, there's lots of miners like you know, um, obviously. The, cold weather, cheap power, and stable political environment. And you can kind of survive with one of those not being quite right, but the status is attractive because you kind of know where you stand. And there is a, there's a lot of land and there's a lot of places you can go and there's a lot of power. But I think we'll see we'll see people doing projects in South America. I mean, there's, there's stuff out there. Mm-hmm. That, there's Telegram channels devoted to it. Um, but it's far away and you've got logistic challenges and all the rest of it. So I think we'll, we'll see more, we'll see other things popping up in a whole bunch of other countries, but Canada, US, Nordics, um, Russia will still be mighty away in the background. Um, there'll still be stuff in Asia and, um, you know, wherever, wherever people, this is a nice thing, wherever somebody plans to, or is willing to invest in generation, miners will turn up. Love it. Okay, last question for you, and kind of answered this already. We're midway through February, towards the end of February, rather. What's your hash rate prediction for the end of this year? We're right now about 300 exahash, depending on uh, which data provider you use. But end of 2023, what number do you see? Um, I, you know, I, I, watching the last few days of uh, blocks arriving in kind of eight minutes and nine minutes or in 10 seconds, you know, I think we'll be at 400. 400. Okay. That's the highest we've gotten so far. I think the, the second highest was 350. So you're, you're certainly bullish on the hash rate, which we love. Uh, Andy, thank you so much for joining us on the Mining Pod. Really enjoy your commentary and your thoughtful insights into mining strategy. Hopefully talk again with you soon. Hey, you're welcome. Great to chat. <laughs>